and Mr. Wong, thank you very much. What an impressive uh, group. And it's my great honor and delight to be invited by the prestigious school and the wisdom uh, name of the first foreign minister. And I came uh, to be the scholar bearing the first foreign minister name, Raja Vanam. What a single honor. And uh, just now, Ambassador Wong was saying that a lot of things are happening and the world is changing. <coughs> In fact, he mentioned why I was shifted from uh, a country in uh, close to Ecuador, Ecuador, and uh, to a place close to the North Pole. In fact, when I presented my credentials to the President of the Republic of Iceland, he asked the same question. He says, Ambassador Su, what happened? <laughs> I replied, global warming. <laughs> you have to, you've got to find an expert in handling uh, Nordic affairs. <laughs> they picked something from the tropic areas. The problem, I'm, I'm more suited for Singapore, a country in which I have such high uh, respect. I did this not uh, out of diplomatic uh, you know, uh, talking points. Because in fact, that when I um, well when I went back from the United States, I, I had a book on uh, international order and China's right uh, responses, changes in the international order and China's uh, correct responses, and I did a paper and a book about United States policy toward China, and also uh, with the issue of Taiwan. But with the United States, I suggested cooperative relations, cooperative, constructive cooperative relations with the United States. Cross-strait relations, I said, well, although it was the following leading with the visit in the 1995, 94, 95, relations was fairly tense, but I proposed uh, keep Taiwan engaged. Economy first. Politics second. And also, use a French phrase that means little by little, easier things first. So when uh, Xi Jinping and Ma Yingjiu were met in the Shangri La, the central TV station had me there. So I have this great honor to Singapore. The small is beautiful. They provided this platform so that the China, the two parts, <coughs> could meet the leaders. Another thing, and when uh, Trump and Kim were meeting here, and I was again invited by the TV station, Chinese national TV, uh, TV station there to on, on site it uh, comments about this event. So when uh, the prestigious school invited me here, they asked me, beside all the regular programs, if there is anything I wanted to see, I said the Capella Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and then later they told me that they are going to have the general manager there, but you know, there is no free lunch. <laughs> In Singapore, the same thing. But they asked, can we use the photographs afterwards? Of course I have to say yes. <laughs> Otherwise there's no visit, uh, no visit arranged. Then they told me that they are going to have, they intend to attract the tourists all over the world. And they maybe stay there one night, two nights, three nights. And eventually, if you have enough Singaporean dollars, They'll be more than happy to provide you with the Trump Kim menu. <laughs> <laughs> Honeymoon, fine too. You know, because Trump later when he ba went back, he said, oh, the two of us just fell into love with each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so historic <coughs> journey of China's diplomacy against this international backdrop. 
And uh, some people ask me, oh, when you go to Singapore, people are so interested in knowing something about this uh, quandary, this uh, wars between the United States, the trade war in the United and, and China. You focus on this. My reply is that instead of having our eyes too close to this canvas, then you won't be able, you will not be able to see very much. My approach is that you stand back and then you'll be able to see the whole grand picture, past, present, maybe the future. In this way, instead of telling you how much the trade war has been going on, I try to offer you where no, against the United, how against the international, changing international backdrop. And the China is moving from the past to the present and hopefully to the future. And in this way, hopefully, we'll be able to thread some light to future developments. That means, uh, if uh, we follow the natural course and we'll be able to and to see what's going to happen. So establishment of the People's Republic of China may be a remarkable event in the 21st century. And, uh, and uh, China uh, move forward, its international status influence constantly grow, and it has become an important force in maintaining, promoting world peace and development. And one can only succeed to end when one keeps the original aspirations. That's what Xi Jinping has to say recently. Bu Wang Shi Zhong, historic journal of China's diplomacy, may be viewed in the following grand strategies. For those people who are interested in knowing what I have to say about, because I've, I've written a much longer journal article. It's called. Uh, 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 and uh, it's in the, uh, China's uh, Journal of International Studies. Uh, the first one, Mao Zedong's era. Second, Deng Xiaoping. And then I will say we move on to a new era and uh, where you can see that uh, it's presided <coughs> over in China by Xi Jinping. And the, in this way, you'll be able just to see where China came from, where China went through, how China went through, where China is stand, uh, standing now. And I would say uh, Mao Zedong, and according to uh, Xi Jinping, led new China to stand up in the, in the world. Uh, origin of diplomacy, if you say Chinese People's Republic was founded in 1949, the People's Republic's diplomacy must be, uh, must start from there. But the, when I did my research, I find that Chinese diplomacy predated the founding of the People's Republic. Because against the background of the Second World War, Chinese communists, it, and during when the Japanese occupied the northeastern part of China, and when, after 1941, after Pearl Harbor, United States and China became war allies. During this period, Mao Zedong had a domestic difficulty because Jiang Kai-shek was trying to strangle the red forces in Yan'an, led by Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists. So for Mao Zedong, he wanted to have a two united, the formation of a two united fronts. Domestically, Domestically, he wanted to uh, get Chinese nationalists of Jiang Kai-shek and uh, Mao Zedong and, 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 and the communist forces led by him to form a united front against Japan. Internationally, he wanted to get uh, more liberal forces of the, what is called the capitalist world, like Great Britain and you know, the United States, Mao Zedong felt uh, these capitalist or cap, uh, capitalist nations are different from Germany, Italy, and so, so on. So he wanted to form another internationally united front. Therefore, he tried to let Zhou Enlai, the other Chinese com, uh, communist uh, diplomats, to get 
more U.S. attention to China. A long story cut short. Then U.S. They decided to send a uh, observatory group. They called themselves the Dixon Mission, the word from the American Civil War. So 1944, July the 22nd, the, there are different ways for you to remember the different dates. For in 1944, my way of remembering this is to cut it into half. 44 cut it into half, it's 22. So July is the knife cut 1944 into, uh, uh, into, into two halves. So July 22nd, 1944, that's the time one American observatory group. And then they cut it twice, actually, because American two groups came. And, the, the, and, and it must have made a large bangs twice. In Chinese, it's ba ba, it's ba ba, bam, bam. And August the 8th, that's the name you'll be able to remember, to memorize. August the 8th, the Chinese internally, the communists, published a, actually they circulated a paper, origin, the start of diplomacy of the communists and of new China. So American observer group came to Yan'an. That is regarded as the start of diplomacy of new China. Just look at the American group, Mao Zedong, Zhu De. They went to the airport. Joe Enlai was talking with the American. So you can see that against the international background of uh, anti-Japanese war, of world war, Mao Zedong was doing something, that is to form United Fronts, and China was trying to get the United States to pay more attention to the China uh, arena, to, so to speak. And against the the international background, the formation of the Cold War, and the bi polar world, 1949, political scientists and students of which all know that there was this formation of two halves of the same Warner, the Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan. So Truman Doctrine and, the, and then starting the containment policy. Now for new China, China was born against this bipolar formation of the bipolar world, the United States at first hesitated on what to do with new China. Soviet Union, at first it was fairly nice in, uh, in, in attracting the communist attention. However, later they found that, that the road towards the success of the revolution was different from that because you are encircling the cities with the countryside. Therefore, Mao Zedong's relationship with the Stalin was never that smooth. That's a long story. So, to s Mao Zedong, but anyway, <coughs> they set up a, the three policies of the new uh, Chinese Republic. That is, set up a separate kitchen, all kinds of uh, uh, analogies, I mean, uh, and also uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, sayings, idioms, and clean the house before inviting the guests, and finally leaning towards one side, leaning towards the socialist camp. So these three are the three original policies of the republic. However, after, I mean, the Mao Zedong stayed in the uh, uh, hotel, he was never happy because of the reasons I told you, but eventually, China and the Soviet Union were able to sign the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance. Remember the, the word alliance, that was the only time probably China got aligned with the Soviet Union, but later it found so many problems as well. Then Korean War, because the United States at first adopted a policy of Wait until the dust to settle. Wait a minute, just to see. And then we'll try to drive edge between Mao, Chinese communists, and the Stalin communists. The United States waited for a while until the Korean War. 
19, uh, July the 25th night, and they found that uh, they decided to intervene. At first, uh, today's lecture is not uh, about the start of the Korean War, and so we simply said the Korean War broke out. And the things that the North was victorious or almost reached present day push on. And the United States, MacArthur, determined to intervene at the present day Incheon Airport, cut the victorious North troops short. The Chinese uh, and then US troops were already crossing the 38 parallels, and MacArthur was just telling the boys, the boys, Come on, home for Christmas. The war was about to be over. And Peng Dehuai, he got a call from the Central Party Committee. There was a special plan sent him from Beijing to Xi'an. Then he figured out, why am I so important? He said, probably it has to do with the situation in North Korea, South Korea. Finally, it was determined that the Chinese volunteers were going to be dispatched to across the Yellow River. And then two nights after, the United States, the, uh, the, the uh, White House called this National Security Council meeting. They made a, a decision to dispatch the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait to prevent the war from further going into that area. Then from this time on, there had been something inserted in the relations between the two countries, the United States and China, these two countries, which even did not have a diplomatic relations. And uh, that was the issue of Taiwan. Taiwan, this issue is still regarded by a top leader in China who said in a poetic fashion, he said, that's just like a piece of cloud, dark cloud, overshadowing the relationship between United States and China. So Chinese side sent Wu Xiuquan to the uh, United Nations to argue with the Americans. However, United Nations then you can say, no, the weaker state, China, it did not have very much to say at this international organization. So China and the North Koreans were labeled as aggressors during the Cold War, uh, during the Korean War. And only after China's seat was restored in the 1970s, 71, 72, and China played file the documentation saying that the original decision was uh, wrong by the United States or by the EU. Okay, oh, not this one. And uh, during the 50s, China's contribution was together with India, with Burma, and other countries. We raised the five principles of, for peaceful coexistence, the mutual respect for sovereignty and the territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, Inter non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. To this date, these five principles are still served as a part of the guiding principles of Chinese foreign policy today. <coughs> and the Chinese foreign policy always has principles and flexibility. Two examples. One is that the, the, the other person, uh, on the, the gentleman on this side, is uh, Chen Xue Sun, top nuclear physicist. And he, was, uh, he has his PhD in uh, uh, Caltech and he was uh, in the United States. He wanted to, to, to come back. The U.S. said after the, Cold, after the Korean War, the United States and China had this link, linkage of diplomat talks at Warsaw. So the U.S. said, okay, we have some people still kept on your side. Repatriate these people. China responded, what about we exchange? U.S. said, what? All you people on our side, they want to come 
to freedom. Who wants to go back? And uh, then the Chinese dipl diplomat, the ambassador, gave them a little pen. In the pen holder, there is a little slip of paper written by Chen Shen, saying that, uh, who am I? I want to, to go back. But the US government has kept him so that he cannot. So the Chinese find a long story short, finally, he was exchanged with the 21 US airmen. He's back, now you can see that. Between these two diplo you know, diplomacy is such, there's never just a accepted uh, you know, a principle by both sides. What can be accepted? So finally, he was exchanged, and uh, he, he came back in China. You asked, it, uh, how can we believe you? You are key to your words. John Lai said, never mind. We'll relieve 11 of them and 10 here. So long as we, we, we have Chen Shishen on our side, we'll return the rest. So that was done. Another thing is that since in Singapore, you maintained a very special relationship with both sides of the uh, strait. I'll mention you something about 1992, because Chiang Kai-shek was wa wanted to stage a comeback, stage a war against mainland, mainland China. But one day, this piece of news was released by the Chinese diplomat to the U.S. representative. After a few days, the U.S. ambassador wanted the Chinese ambassador, told the Chinese ambassador to come to the office so that we can have a meeting. U.S. response was, if the nationalists want to stage a military assault against the mainland side, it's not in the interests of the U.S. If they want to do, let us come together and deal with it. So in 1962, the reason why Chiang Kai-shek aborted no, no, the military assault against the mainland side was aborted, secret, we say. There is a U.S. role in it. You can see that U.S. also has its principles and also flexibility. And the U.S. China Mutual Defense Treaty, and as to start with, Dallas wanted, uh, didn't want U.S. to be aligned, I mean, uh, sign this treaty. And uh, to start with, Mao Zedong uh, decided to stay, to start this bombardment against Komoi and Mazu, 1954, and that ended in 1957-58. To start with, it was a real bombardment. But after a while, after a while, what was in the mind of Mao Zedong was to keep the Americans out of the Chinese internal affairs. Okay, if you don't, and Mao Zedong decided to have the bombardment towards 1957-58, on even days, you are free to send ammunition, supplies to the front. Odd days, and there is a part where they have a loud speaker saying that tomorrow, please do not come. That's a very special world warfare. In fact, if you use your computer and are trying to find a special paper, it's called a da da ting ting and a da ting ting da da. <laughs> it means stop and stop and fight and fight and stop and stop, you know. Uh, and because Mao Zedong was saying that, uh, and the reason why we have this uh, fanfare of bombardment against uh, Kumoi is for the purpose of helping Jiang Kai-shek in his best way defend this island. You know, that kind of uh, strategy to help Jiang Kai-shek defend Komoi. So the reason is to keep the American influence uh, and out of this. And in the 1960s and the 70s, there was a major shift from this leaning toward one side, towards the Soviet uh, socialist camp. That is, uh, Mao Zedong said, that we must uh, form a yi tiao xian, that one line uh, uh, strategy. So in the world, and uh, like uh, there is a, uh, there in Chinese, uh, there is, uh, in China, there is a very famous uh, uh, book known as uh, 
the romance of the three kingdoms, Sun Guo Yan Yi. The beginning is just the world is long divided. Eventually, it has to unite. If you have unity in the world, eventually it has to t divide. <coughs> so if you ask you, uh, what we think about the international arena situation, U.S.-China relations, we say, okay, as so long as we move along, maybe this is already October, then November, uh, December, China is still there. Maybe you have a few sectors in China which, which, we are, uh, which are not that comfortable. However, we'll get by. And eventually, you can see that uh, there is going to be an ending of some sort. Let's just wait. So the whole strategy is that if U.S., I think now the other stronger guy, they want to invite China, push China or drag China into the box ring arena. They want to fight us to, to be involved in the fight. So my response is that for anything from the U.S. camp to invite to have a cutthroat fight, we say, oh, okay, we will respond with the challenges of Taiji. <laughs> so 60s, international situation, with these great changes, the biggest brother for China at the beginning turned out to be the strongest, the biggest threat, especially after Jinbao Island. So ideological struggle, uh, differences uh, turn out to be a contention for national security. Now those, this, this is not uh, just a wheat field. This is Soviet tanks and armored vehicles. The mother Dong just started uh, rethinking about the geographic mapping and the China's responses. So he started the third line of the defense, San Xian Jianzhe. Therefore, uh, Zhou Enlai asked uh, Chen Yi and the other three generals to come out with a new response. And Dong Lian Sun Wu Bei Ju Cao Cao, that means uh, during uh, the uh, Three Kingdoms period, uh, Zhuge Liang, the master strategist, suggested that uh, if there are three kingdoms there, two are weaker, one is the strongest. The two weaker ones might as well push aside or shelve away their differences, and then they may come together and form an alliance dealing with the stronger. Uh, therefore, Kissinger, because of his quoted stomachache, suddenly disappeared in Pakistan, and then he came to, me, uh, to, to, to have a meeting uh, with uh, Zhou Enlai. And then they paved the way. So Nixon came, and the biggest issue of Taiwan was the push aside. Martin said, that the two of us, we can just talk about the bigger things. Let the specific things worked <laughs> out by Zhou Enlai and Kissinger. So with regards to the issue of Taiwan, Kissinger said, you want to recognize the boundaries. It's a little difficult for us to do. What about, we say, the Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait all recognize that there is only but one China, the United States, takes no, uh, that talks no difference of this. So finally it was settled like that. And the, and the Kissinger and Mao, they sat down, they held their hands for 42 seconds. And this long-term enemy sat down, they start with the jokes and even involving uh, women. For instance, Mao Zedong said, how come that Kissinger, you went to have your secret meeting with, uh, with Chinese representative in uh, Paris? Kissinger, Nixon said, well, Kissinger uses his girlfriends as a cover. You know, both sides, you know, just laughed and, and then Mao Zedong said, <laughs> stick out his thumb, saying that your atom body, you are this. And Russia is this, he stick out his left hand thumb. And then Mao Zedong only used uh, 
the little finger to refer to China. If I were to do this, and I get big trouble. But if uh, Mao Zedong did this, uh, I'm fine. <laughs> so Mao Zedong said, we are this. But Mao Zedong said, if the two of us, we come together, we can deal with that uh, you know, uh, threat from the uh, north. So the Foreign Affairs College, the Chinese School of Diplomacy, the textbook says this. But I read the original minus. Mao Zedong actually said, if the two of us together, we can deal with that bastard. <laughs> with that one bar down. But the translator <laughs> translated into a son of a bitch. <laughs> so they just laughed and laughed and talked. So the first round of talk involved you know, diplomatic, you know, not so diplomatic talks like this. So that was international relations. So 41, the China was accepted, the uh, United Nations, China began to have ties with the Western uh, uh, countries, and the Jap Japan's relations was normalized, and so on. So behind this uh, background, you can see that uh, this is uh, just the end of the first stage of Chinese diplomacy. The second stage is Deng Xiaoping uh, theory, and uh, independent foreign uh, policy of peace, 独立自主的和平外交政策. 80s, Deng Xiaoping led another major adjustment, that's to change China's diplomacy into independent foreign policy for, for change. Because as we now all know, diplomacy is what? It's an extension of any country's domestic politics. China's domestic policy, 78, Deng Xiaoping says that from now on, we will stop class struggle domestically. Let's bend on economic construction. That's an important basis for Chinese diplomacy. During this period, the international situation also witnessed many changes. Soviet Union's expansion suffered setbacks and so on. And then China and the between the United States and, uh, and, and the Soviet Union, and, the, and the Reagan, Reagan's time, and the Deng Xiaoping was saying that if China aligned itself uh, with the United States, it's not going to be uh, that good, and it does not going to proceed uh, for world peace and stability. So it was time to change. And China is a big country, you, you know. <coughs> China needs to uh, change the original one line strategy. The China's uh, domestic policy also uh, uh, in the international uh, and, uh, well, was, was aimed at creating a long term peace and stability in the international and the surrounding environment for this uh, uh, modernization. Program that is Deng Xiaoping said, or well, our policy, the purpose must be for uh, creating and uh, lasting for a prolonged stability uh, for domestic uh, economic construction. And therefore, 1979-82, Deng Xiaoping twice was made uh, Man of the Year by the magazine, the well-known magazine Time, and then with the new. Uh, international situation, Deng Xiaoping and uh, Ma Ma Margaret Thatcher, they were discussing on the policy of one country, two systems, and eventually paving the way for uh, the return of Hong Kong. Of course, Deng Xiaoping was saying that Thatcher said, well, gee, look at you. You do not have the uh, experience in running Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong's affairs, and uh, maybe you leave Hong Kong is still in the hands of Great Britain of the empire. Deng Xiaoping is a chain smoker, <coughs> stopped one cigarette saying that. We only talk about the time and the fashion for Hong Kong's return. And the Thatcher went out, almost got stumbled at the staircases of the, of the Great Hall of the People. And then long continue the cooperation and the U.S.-China relations, some people call it uh, 10 years honeymoon. Look at what Reagan has to say about uh, Deng Xiaoping. He said that, uh, I truly like that little guy. 
So 80s, 90s, drastic changes happened in East Europe and turbulence and reorganization of the international system. And East Europe, disintegration of the Soviet Union, falling down of the uh, Berlin Wall. And also, what, and something happened in uh, 1989 in Beijing. Against all this background, Deng Xiaoping said a few things, including keeping a low profile and have something accomplished at the Tao Guang Yang Hui. Uh, sometimes it's translated in the, in the West papers as bite your bullet and wait your time. Actually, <laughs> Deng Xiaoping would say just keep a low profile, uh, independent pro uh, piece of uh, uh, policy of peace stood the test of sudden change in international situation. And uh, it was, uh, and the U.S., headed by the U.S., decided to impose uh, sanctions of China. So we have had sanctions. But Deng Xiaoping analyzed the overall situation and uh, said that to keep a low profile and uh, never say or doing anything beyond our capacity and uh, with something accomplished. So uh, only uh, less than one month after uh, June 4th, Scowcroft, National Security Advisor, visited Beijing. Of course, that turned out to be a controversial visit by the, in the, in the U.S. Congress. Towards the end, uh, June, December the 9th, Scowcroft came to China the second time. Deng Xiaoping said some uh, historic, uh, something which I would say of historic value. He said, U.S.-China, we have various problems, but sooner or later, eventually, U.S. and China should maintain good or cooperative relationship. This is what Deng Xiaoping had to say. And uh, then 97, you, you can see after 8 and 9, 12 years, the Chinese uh, president got his uh, first uh, uh, U.S. visit. But U.S.-China relations, international relations, you see so many ups and downs. Bombardment of the Chinese embassy. But this page of history was turned. U.S. apologized. <coughs> then shortly after that, uh, that was previous year, but two ye the year 2000, the permanent <coughs> normal trade relations was signed, ending the congressional debate of the most favored nations uh, treatment. So the in the, by, the, in the, by the end of every year, the U.S. Congress does not have to debate whether they will extend the most favored nation treatment. But not long after, <coughs> there had been this collision incident, U.S. Uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, plan and uh, they got this middle air collision with the Chinese uh, uh, aircraft. <coughs> but finally, uh, well, George Bush and the, 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 the son identified China uh, as a strategic uh, opponent. But after 9-1-1, but after that incident was uh, solved, 9-1-1 terrorist attack occurred. The Chinese uh, top leader was the second among world leaders <coughs> to pick up the phone and call the White House. Thereafter, the bilateral relations improved and the United States gradually began to regard China as, I quote, a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Jiang Zemin was invited to Crawford, normally if you are not uh, so familiar with each other, <coughs> you don't invite people to your homes like that. So China and United States began to have a constructive, cooperative relationship. And 
one year after, after 15 years of hard work, United States agreed. <coughs> China was allowed to join the WTO, marking a new state in China's opening up. After just following the, in the 10 years following WTO, <coughs> these figures would show that how Chinese economy started from low end all the way in making tremendous programs, progresses in all around the way. Just look at this part. This uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, GDP rose by two uh, uh, folds and with the annual growth of less than 10% annually. <coughs> 2010, China's overall economy over took that of Japan, making China the second largest economy in the world. However, we have to remember that China's per capita GDP only ranked 87th in the world. So China still say that we are a developing country. Singapore, you are far ahead of us. <coughs> so reform and open to the outside. It's the second Chinese revolution. Change China and with China's embracing of globalization and making its contribution and also adds changes in the world <coughs> system as well. Then the 19th part of Congress in China, Xi Jinping, and the third stage currently, so I won't go to uh, 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 very deep because you know what's happening now. Xi Jinping needs a new era of diplomacy with the Chinese characteristics. Zhongguo uh, Tese, diplomacy. Uh, uh, 2017, uh, it's a, a conference with a far-reaching historical conferences. And because uh, as China sees the world, therefore there's a great development, dramatic change, and a major adjustment. Because the United States and the West and all these industrial powers, they continue to have the leading roles. However, world scale, you can see a group of, uh, a, or a large number of developing countries and new economies on the rise. Therefore, I wouldn't say the U.S. has already declined. <coughs> yes, <coughs> for this status quo power, there's a, a lot of anxiety in his mind. So that would explain why the U.S., what, how U.S. sees China in our uh, opinion. So a great development, a drastic change, and a major adjustment. But the political multipolarity and economic globalization continue to be the general trend. So there, there is anxiety of the status quo power China's exter and external environment, both the positive and negative factors are on the rise. <laughs> Development of China is still an important uh, historic opportunity. <coughs> uh, 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 still in an important uh, period of opportunity. And the biggest opportunity for China lies in the fact that China itself is still developing. So if uh, you ask about me about the U.S.-China relation now, I think if China, we keep, stand still, keep domestic stability, if our economy still manages, that will be fine. 19th part of Congress. The new blueprint from now to 2020, finish the building a moderate and prosperous society from then to uh, 35, 15 years, it's a socialist modernization basically realized. A lot of political jargons. And from 35 
35 to the middle of the century and to develop uh, that is the centennial goal. That is uh, the 1949 <coughs> to 2049 or basically 2050. And China will be turned into a, a modern socialist country. And that's what uh, Xi Jinping has said about uh, and China stand up, China became prosperous, and China becomes strong. That means how do we de determine strong? It's not that China is going to bully others or an anything. It's, it's uh, the official documents is China is uh, prosperous, strong, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. The that's the purpose. So the three steps. Deng Xiaoping also had his three steps. The blueprint. So and also we talk about overall goals and that external and uh, uh, goals is uh, uh, diplomacy is an extension of domestic uh, uh, affairs. So overall goals for Chinese diplomacy in the new era is promote a new type of state to state relations. The second is the community of a shared future for mankind. And then the key is the peace development, cooperation, and win-win. Most recently, you can see that um, Chinese diplomacy has uh, dialogue rather than confrontation, partnership rather than alliance, and so no alliance. And the Belt and Road Initiative, I'll just show some slides because you all know the uh, concept well. And the Xi Jinping and the five in one, and it promotes uh, economy, uh, cooperation, and interconnectivity in uh, economy, politics, culture, society, and <coughs> ecology. And then Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 and uh, the general direction and the five uh, or six economic corridors and the uh, wide consultation, joint uh, uh, contribution and the shared benefits. And the different possibilities of linkages, corridors. And then the first one is the policy. The second one is uh, this is uh, uh, finance, and that one, the uh, infrastructure, and this one is the people to people. Most important is people to people. So they promote the policy coordination, facilitate the connectivity, and uh, impeded uh, trade and financial uh, integration and the people to people contact. <coughs> and how many? Uh, people involved in all these areas and the different figures. And then uh, China tries to not only impose its own economic strategy with others, but <coughs> incorporate its own economic program, economic strategies with the different countries. For the <coughs> Russia, we have, they have the uh, US, Eurasia Union. Well, in Mongolia, they have the Bright Road and uh, uh, Kazakhstan, you know, Bright Road and, and, and so on. And uh, 2017, this uh, forum, Belt and Road, was held in Beijing and achieved uh, uh, some initial uh, progress. And AIB was established, and then over 130 countries attended, sent a representative to attend the 2017 DRI conference. And uh, culturally, uh, gradually, uh, uh, the Belt and Road has become an open and inclusive international platform for cooperation. So Xi Jinping was uh, making a speech. And uh, from this one, bottom line, then these countries, they have a high presence, uh, the top US, uh, they have some uh, you know, doubts and, and so on. Final, but finally, we try to approach different parties to, as to lessen some of the fears or uh, uh, misunderstandings. And uh, this is uh, the, how the different uh, conferences uh, were, were, were held. And uh, 
And for China's overall diplomacy, we often talk about it, that we have four realms, four areas of diplomacy. One is Da Wo Guanxi, major country relationship. Second, Zhou Bian Guanxi, in the neighboring countries. Third, the developing countries. Uh, the fourth, Duo Bian Wai Jiao, multilateral diplomacy. You can see Putin and, uh, and the United States, Europe, and all these would be the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, major and, uh, uh, countries. Trump was invited, Xi Jinping went to the United States, Trump was in China. But there are some issues. Well, at the, for, instance, for this region, I only showed us uh, South China Sea, for instance. The reason why China had its own analogy is that in 1940s, China borrowed the, the United States four destroyers in order to retake some of the islands from the Japanese occupation. The reason why the island Zhongye is called Zhongye, the reason why the island Taiping is called Taiping, because these U.S. ships were named that way. And the Chinese uh, used the U.S. ships in uh, reclaiming these islands and renamed these islands with the U.S. destroyers' names. This is Taiping. And then you know that there was the arbitration and the worsening of relations uh, with the Philippines. But finally, with Duterte, some people said Duterte showed some a gesture of friendship, the Chinese returned with the embrace of arms. <laughs> the an an analogy is to take away the burning logs instead of adding flame to it. And then another interesting thing is, uh, tough issue is the North Korean uh, <laughs> nuclear issue and the third deployment. But thanks to Singapore, Trump and Kim met, and then not long afterwards, Kim to China. He came in a short while, three times. And they had in the meeting, Dalian, and June came again. Happy this year, we have the Papua New Guinea, South Africa, Argentina, and Singapore. The last one, then, that the Chinese regard these four as the most important four uh, important international conferences. Domestic, we have the Boa, we have Qingdao, we have the China, African, and we have another one. And Chinese is going to have an import, uh, like a, a conference, and, and, and the show. It used to be export, now this import event in Shanghai. And then now the biggest challenge is the US China possible trade war. So that the, 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 the other cartoon is uh, where I, I got it from, from somewhere, it's not uh, my own invention. They said, well, you hurt somebody, and you, you might hurt your own interests. And uh, this shows that in the, from uh, uh, March to April, and then uh, this is the side of the Chinese response. The other side is how U.S. Uh, the areas of U.S. Uh, uh, the, uh, the san uh, sanctions uh, or U.S. just uh, tariffs raised against the Chinese uh, uh, high tech and uh, biochemistry, but Chinese regarded it with pork, with uh, uh, with 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 with, uh, with some agricultural products. <laughs> Mm. But then this Chinese uh, uh, government regards this uh, mm, trade protectionism is a double-edged sword. You can hurt some Chinese industry, but eventually you're going to hurt your, your own. And then I got another one, the economic super bowl. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, you can see different uh, uh, responses. And then, uh, with regards to, I won't uh, go into all details. I only say that uh, Chinese side only uh, not long ago issued this uh, white paper, basically saying that That means uh, we are not choosing to fight with you. They're not our choosing, and we are not uh, afraid of this. No, we, we, and finally, if you plunge us into a fight, then we have to take up the challenge. But that being said, 
we all say that, uh, well, the gate doors for negotiation is widely open. Eventually, I have to quote a line from President Xi Jinping. Cooperation is the only correct choice for the United States and China. And, to, and for all, you know, and Xi Jinping said, globalization is the way to go. The second, the door of China will not be closed, rather it will be opened wider. And thirdly, and we all and do, 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 do things, and he also mentioned uh, looking at the 40 year, and uh, uh, okay. So we, all, we have opportunities, the ties of peace, development, the corporate <coughs> openness, integration, and we have challenges, that is anti-globalization, movements and the trade uh, uh, protectionism. And we must be prepared for danger in times of peace, take preventive measures. Uh, and, uh, and as a firm, and a firm promoter of economic globalization, China will strive to make uh, substantial upgrading of overall modernization, and it will be, uh, the gate will be uh, made much wider lay open for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the China's gate of opening to the outside will be made much wider. And Chinese people will join hands with the people of all countries to, to build a community of a shared future for mankind and a world that's peaceful, stable, prosperous, open, and uh, beautiful. With this, all well, the containership still, go, still goes on, goes out. I think Singapore welcomes more ships to come in uh, here. And with this, and this is a picture I took in Iceland. So thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, and although this is afternoon, I'll say that uh, good night uh, tonight. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh,